الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. As we wanted to continue down the hundred very important personalities in Islam that we should all know, I could have continued in the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم until we finished the hundred and we still wouldn't have completed what we need to know about the Sahaba رضي عنهم. But due to the fact that we don't have unlimited time and we want to try to make progress throughout the history of Islam, I decided to move to the next best generation, which is the Tabi'un. Those that saw the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and followed them from the Salihin, from amongst them in righteousness. But they, they did not see the Prophet وسلم, or they did not يعني, see him in a state of Iman or so on. So they're not from the Sahaba, but they are from a praised generation. The best generation after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companions, a generation that was praised by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself when he talked about the best of generations being his, and then the one after them, and then we'll talk about those after them later, inshaAllah taala. But it was a very difficult decision, which tabi'i, yani those that are the successors after the companions, which tabi'i do we begin with? There's so many amazing. Uh, and scholars and mujahideen and qurra and I mean, amazing personalities amongst them. So how I chose is I was reading a, a, a book on a different subject, a subject of mustala al-hadith, of the grading of hadith. And under a type of hadith that's called mursal, where the sahabi is missing, uh, it's a form of weakness. But Imam Ahmad and Imam al-Shafi'i and others, they accepted the mursal ahadith of certain tabi'een because they were so senior and so trustworthy and they only reported from the Sahaba. So the first one I saw amongst them, I chose to speak about. But before I mention his name, I've given you one hint. I'm gonna ask you guys, all right? Not you, you will get it anyway. Some of the, mashallah, future ulama of our ummah, right? So first thing is his marasil, his ahadith, because he never met the Prophet Wasallam. But if he says, on the authority of the Prophet ﷺ, the ulama would accept his narrations. Why? Because he didn't report from other tabi'un. He would report from the Sahaba, and the Sahaba are all adilun. So that's the first hint. But I'm going to give you a lot of hints. The second hint that I'm going to give you, which are also his fadail, his virtues, that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great Khalifa, the later, and he's not from the early four, but he's considered the fifth or sixth of the righteous khulafa. He would never make a decision without consulting this person. And he was that important of a person that Umar Abdul Aziz said that any time he would make a decision, he would make sure that this person is there to give his counsel. Imam al-Dhahabi and Ibn Kathir and many uh, imma and ulama, I looked at their biographies uh, regarding this scholar. They called him the Alim of Ahlul Madina. Alim Ahlul Madina. Yani the great scholar of the people of Medina, the Sayyid of the Tabi'een, the leader of the Tabi'een, the one of the Fuqaha Sab'a, the seven great Fuqaha of Medina, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahl Sunnah, yani the great Imam of Jarwa Ta'adil said about this Tabi'een that of the Tabi'een, that he was the best of that generation. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah is a sahabi. Abdullah ibn Umar is a sahabi. Somebody came to him with a question. And some of the ulama said the question had to do with nikah and talaq. So Abdullah ibn Umar, the sahabi, and not just the sahabi, he is from the muftis of the sahaba. The five Abdullahs that are famous from the sahaba that used to give fatwa. He said, go ask this tabi'i. I imagine that honor that he was given. It was said about him yani, that he is the faqih of the fuqaha. Yani, he is the scholar of fiqh amongst the scholars of fiqh. And they said when he was there in Medina, people would not give fatwa if he was present. Alim al-hadith, alim al-fiqh, alim al-tafsir. He was an alim in many uloom 
But one of the things that stood out that al Dhabi and others mentioned about him as well, that he is from the most profound scholars amongst the Tabi'un in narrating hadith. And that's why Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, when he was asked, do we accept a hadith from him, even when he does irsal, they said, yes, we accept from him. And a Shafi'i and others accepted this as well. In fact, one of the golden chains, this is the last hint I'm giving you, huh? One of the golden, you know the golden chain in hadith, like that chain that is undisputed, you know, like for example, there is uh, a Nafi'i, a Nafi'i, for example, when Imam Malik reports from Nafi'i from Abdullah ibn Umar, that's one of the well-known standards. But one of them is a Zuhri from this scholar, from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Alright, who can tell me? Huh? Imam who? A Zuhri? No, because Zahri is the one that never reports from him. Sa'id ibn Musayyib. That is correct. Barak Allah fiq, Umar. Allahumma barak lak. Allah increase you in your barakah. Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Some of the ulama, they wrote him Sa'id ibn Musayyib with the fatha on the shadda on top of the ya. And even many of the lectures online, they, they call him out like that. And one of them was saying, you can say it both ways. But the actual correct pronunciation is Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib with a kasra on the ya. In fact, he hated to be called Musayyib because this is the name of his father. And Musayyib means the one that people have abandoned. Musayyib with the kasra means the one that abandoned the people is not in need of them. And he would say, whoever calls me Musayyib, may Allah يعني, abandon him. So don't call him Musayyib. Sa'id ibn Musayyib from the great Tabi'un, Abdurrahman ibn Zayd ibn Aslama, also a Tabi'i, he said, Lama mat al when the people of Ibadah, yani the senior Sahaba, died, and he mentioned from the Ibadah, yani the Abd, it comes from the word Abd, those that were people from the Sahaba, for example, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, Abdullah ibn Amr, these are the Ibadah from the Sahaba. Radiyahu. And then the fifth, as people mention Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, but in this narration, he mentions these. He said, when they died, when these great worshippers, these great scholars, these great fuqaha from the Sahaba died, he said, the knowledge spread throughout the land. Yani, throughout the different Muslim lands. And he said, most of them that took that knowledge were freed slaves. And that shows one of the great things about Islam. The people that were captured in wars weren't just put in and he get more, you know, places where they were tortured and things. No, they were brought into the houses. They were treated as equals. They were freed. They were fed. They were taught until they became the leaders of the Muslim Ummah. And from them, he mentioned the Faqih of Mecca, Ata, the Faqih of Yemen, which is Ta'us, the Faqih of Yamama, which is Yahya ibn Abi Kathir. He said the Faqih of Basra, which is Hassan al-Basri. He said the, the Faqih of Kufa, which is Ibrahim al nikhai and then he said the Faqih of Sham, which is Makhul. And then he said the Faqih of Khurasan, which is Atal al Khurasani. But then he said, all of these, in Madina, except Medina. In Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a khas a Qurashi, a man from Quraysh, and made him the Faqih of Medina, which is Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. And he said about him that he was from the greatest of them, yani of the Tabi'un. Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. They would, Ibn Kathir, Imam Ibn Kathir, in Bidayah wa Niha, he, he says, Kana alam, he was the most knowledgeable. Ahlul Ard, kullaha fi zamani. And he was the most knowledgeable of the people of the earth in his generation. Meaning not to compare him with the Sahaba, but the Tabi'un. So I think we chose the right person to begin with. Al Dhabi says about him, Al Imam, uh, Al Imam al Ilm, he was the Imam in Ilm. And he was the alim, Ahlul Medina, and a Sayyid the Tabi'in. He was the alim of the people of Medina, and he was the Sayyid, he was the leader of, the, of his generation of the Tabi'un. His kunya is Abu Muhammad, he is Al Qurashi, and he is from the Quraysh tribe, Al Maghzumi. Banu Maghzum, this is a, a very powerful sub clan within the Quraysh. From it are people like Abu Jahl. And he, and from it are people like Khalid ibn al-Walid. But he was also from the same tribe. He was born 
15 Hijri. But this is what the Jamhur have mentioned. 15th Hijri, meaning two years about into the Khilafah of Umar ibn Khattab. Hijri calendar becomes from the Hijra and so on. And many of the ulama have clearly stated he died at the age of 75. But some of the ulama said he died at 95 Hijri, which would put him a little older. But he lived, alhamdulillah, a long life. He saw Umar ibn Khattab radiyanhu. And many ulama felt that he didn't report a hadith from Umar directly, but he did. As Ahmad ibn Hanbal was asked, he said even though he was eight years of age around when Umar radiyan died, but he was such an intelligent young man that he had seen Umar and heard from him and he reported those ahadith from Umar ibn Khattab radiyanhu. But he has a lot of ahadith that is reported from Uthman ibn Affan and Ali ibn Abi Talib and Zayd ibn Thabit, and Abu Musa al-Ashari, and Sa'ad, and Aisha, and Abu Huraira, and Ibn Abbas, and Muhammad ibn Maslama, and Umm Salama, and great number of Sahaba radiyan. He was at that early time, and at a young age, somebody who would re record the ahadith in his mind, so he became extremely proficient in reporting. Now, one of the reasons why he is uh, one of the reasons that he is very well acquainted with ahadith and reporting is because of who he married. He married the daughter of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Now, imagine when you have a father-in-law like Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira is the one that narrated the most ahadith of anybody from the Sahaba radiyan. And that's his father-in-law. So when he was somebody who was yani, always around such a person, then he would record, memorize those ahadith from his father-in-law and from his wife and from the other Sahaba. And he became the, one of the most yani, narrators of hadith amongst the tabi'un. Because his father-in-law was the greatest Narrator of hadith from the Sahaba radiyallahu He was such a eloquent man and such an intelligent man and such a dedicated man that the age of 20 he was giving fatawa in Madin. And this was not normal at that time. They didn't have like a four year alim course or something like this where you kind of just get done. No. At that time, you would sit at the feet of the scholars and you would learn and you would memorize and you would record until you were and you're an old man and then people would allow you to give fatawa. But they were the exception to the rule. Why? Because Allah blessed them with that because of their taqwa and their wara and so on. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, later on, you will see at the age of 13, he was writing amazing works. Uh, Imam Bukhari at the age of 19, he finished his first big book. But, but those were exceptions because they were exceptionally intelligent and pious and Allah gave them that as a blessing. So at the age of 20 in Medina, he was giving fatwa while Sahaba were still alive. While the Sahaba were still alive. Because he preserved that knowledge from different Sahaba so well. From his students, Ata al-Khurasani, who was again one of the great a'imma and ulama, Qatada, Nafi', and he's the famous Nafi' that Imam Malik takes so much of the knowledge from Ibn Shihab Zuhri, which we mentioned that reported a hadith from him, and he is the teacher of Imam Malik, uh, Zayd ibn Aslama, Salib ibn Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al Khattab, and he is the son of Abdullah ibn Umar. He used to take knowledge from his father, but he used to also go and take knowledge from Sayyid ibn Musayyib, and uh, the other uh, Ata from Mecca, and so on. These were people that would take knowledge from him. From his dedication to knowledge, he didn't like taking money for knowledge. And this is something and he almost lost today. And he, yes, the Khulafa at that time would at time from Baytul Mal give to the ulama and nothing wrong with that. And there would be people that would give gifts and, and things like this to the ulama to try to and he, make their life easier. Yes. But they didn't do it for money. That, that's the important thing. Today, this is one of the problems in the Ummah. I'm not saying you can't charge for knowledge because obviously I mean, the, the teachers of knowledge also have to eat and feed their families, you know. But when it becomes about money, 
more than about the knowledge where it's always about how much you can make and how, how you can make it entertaining and this and so on. This is the problem that gets to be. And this is why the ulema of the past were very yani, afraid of this. So what he did is he had a business where he would buy oil yani, and, and he would sell. So he would have that business and of course yani, he couldn't dedicate the amount of time to that business that other people could. So the people in Medina, they would try to facilitate it for him to make it easier for him to then spend more time teaching and so on. But he didn't take money for teaching. His, his dars was free. So he would make his money, but he would then dedicate most of his day to the masjid. And that's why he himself mentions that for 40 years, this is something unimaginable in our time. We can talk about it, but it's very difficult. For 40 years, he said, he didn't miss a single salah in Masjid al nabwi with the takbirat al-ihram, with the first takbir. Now for our time, it's very like one of the shiuch that was and he writing about this, a recent shiuch. He said, you know, in our time it's very difficult because of work and people going and things being far. But at that time, subhanAllah, the market of Medina was very close to Masjid al nabwi In fact, today they say it's already it's inside the compound. So then, you know, when he would go, to the market between salawat, do his trade, go back to the masjid for salah, and then many of the people would take care of his business so he could then teach. So, 40 years, subhanAllah, he was making the salah five times in Masjid Nabi Takbirat al Haram. The only time that he would be away from it, as he mentions, is when he went for Hajj and so on. And subhanAllah, he did 40 Hajj in his lifetime. 40 Hajj. Now that was very unusual at that time. Today, it's unusual unless you have a business or something or you live there. It's very difficult. But at that time, it was more difficult because traveling and so on, even though since he was in Medina, it's not far like Basra or Kufa or Damascus or something. But still going and traveling and taking that time and spending and, and he, it was still not an easy thing. And that's why Many of the ulama like Ibn Kathir, he wrote about him, that he was the only one that we know from that generation that did 40 hajj in a lifetime. He did the most amongst his peers. Now, there are some very important events that happened in his life. There are many, but I'm not, I mean, obviously, this is just an intro to his life, right? But there's two that are very important that I want to talk about, inshallah. And these are mentioned by Imam al-Zahabi, Ibn Kathir, and, 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 uh, and Hilyat al-Awliya, and Ibn Jawzi, and, and Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad. I mean, I researched all the different uh, books of biographies. And these two are almost mentioned, at least this one that I'm going to mention, almost every one of them has. It. In his time, while he was, and he, not, when he, was, he was born in the Khilafah of Umar Radiyan, so obviously he was a young man in the time, or, or a child in the time of the Khilafah of Uthman and Ali radiyallahu anhum. But when he was teaching and when he was at his peak of, of, of giving lessons and so on, it was the Khilafah of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was a very and he powerful, and, and, and we've discussed him in the Sira Durus because we went into the Amawiyah, and he, he had a lot of uh, uh, ru'b, as they would say. You know, people were very afraid of him, he was very strong minded. So, in his time, he was in Medina. And at a time he told one of his servants that go and bring me a person of hadith. A person yani, who was a scholar of hadith. I want somebody to narrate hadith to me. Like subhanAllah. Yani, that's why I'm saying sometimes when we read the books of tarikh and Marwan, Abdul Malik, Marwan and Walid and those after them, the people are very critical of them. And of course, they were not Sahaba, they were not, I and mean, most of them, they made mistakes, they did things that were cruel at times and so on. But, but again, before you criticize them, think about the good that they had. That today, I mean, it's unimaginable how good they were compared to us today. So he wasn't like, bring a singing woman to entertain me or sing me. No, he said, bring a person of hadith, you know. That was, the, that was how he wanted to busy his free time. So the servant went to the masjid 
and he looked around and the person with the most people around him and the most people who were paying attention was Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. So he went to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib and he told him like this. And he pointed to him and ishara like this, come. So Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib looked at him and he continued the dance. He didn't get up. And, he, and this is something about him. He was very respectful with hadith. Even at a later time, I mean a different incident when he was very sick, he was laying down, somebody came and asked him about hadith. Even when he was in physical pain, he got up to narrate the hadith because he didn't want to disrespect the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So when he's giving the dars and somebody went like this, he ignored him, he continued the dars. So after the dars, the, the man said, do you know who I am? He said, yeah, you're the servant of the Khalifa. He says, oh, then I was calling you, why didn't you come? He said, you didn't see that I was reading Qala Allah, Qala Rasul? And he was giving the dars on the hadith. So he told him, the Khalifa is calling you. He told him, well, I mean, he can call me, but I have no need for him. <laughs> and if he has a need for me, let him come here. It's very I mean, unimaginable to speak like this. So he told him, do you understand? And the Khalifa is called. He said, did he call me by name? He said, no. He just said, bring a person up. He said, okay, then go get one of these others. <laughs> so this servant, he went back to and he, uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, and he told him that I went. He didn't say who it was yet. He told him I went, and this is what happened. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan told him, was it Sa'id ibn Musayyib? He said, yes. He said, okay, leave him alone. And this is the honor the ulema had at that time. But there are some reasons for it. Some of them, obviously, their taqwa and their war'a, their piety and their piousness, but also because the people stood with them. And even in our generations, when we look at the likes of the Sheikh ibn Baz and Sheikh ibn Al-Thaymeel and Sheikh Al-Bani and so on, the people also stood with them. And that's one of the things today, people talk a lot, but they talk a lot while sitting comfortably somewhere far away from what they're talking about. <laughs> they may speak about a alim and how brave, but, but they don't really go and stand with them. That, that's one of the problems with us today. And we'll make excuses. Oh, no, no, this guy and I, whatever, you know. Allah musta'an. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he was impressed by Sayyid ibn Musayyid. And he saw the people respect him. And he saw the knowledge he had. So his wali lahad, yani his crown prince, his, the next one to be Khalifa after him, at this time they had made it uh, like a kingdom in the sense that the son would take it, was al wali. And if you remember the Sirah Durus when we talked about Amu'ya, he did become the Khalifa of the Muslims after Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So he said, I want to marry a very good woman, a very pious woman for my son. And again, Amu'iyah with all their shortcomings, that's still, I mean, mashallah, I yeah. think. Right? So he said, I want to know who is the most knowledgeable of women, a beautiful woman, somebody good. So he, I mean, from the families and women and others, they said, you know what, the daughter of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyid. He said, his daughter is beautiful and knowledgeable and, and intelligent. He said, okay, send a proposal from the Khalifa for the crown prince and wali to Sayyid ibn al-Musayyib that you know and, and I was reading some of the different books that narrate this some of them I mean, they, they mentioned how when the people were bringing this blood they were, they were telling him you know the greatest thing has happened to you the best news you know I mean, I mean, the great Allah has brought the greatest khair to your house the Khalifa is, is asking for his son the one who is the crown prince to be King after him for your daughter, Allahu Akbar, you should be so happy. Sayyid al Musayyib looked down. He said, May Allah protect us, may Allah musta'an. And he said, No. <laughs> Who turns down the proposal from the Khalifa for the crown prince? I mean, and these weren't like drunks and stuff either, right? These were people, you know, we discussed them in the seerah and so on. They were fighting jihad, they were, I mean, they were defending the Muslim land, they were praying, they were giving khutbah, and they used to give the Eid khutbah, they used to give Shuma khutbah and things like this. So the person that brought this news, and this, like I said, this incident for, about his daughter, this is, you can find it across the board in, in the kutub, but of course more detailed in some books than others. They told him, do you understand that the, the, the magnitude of what you're doing. This is the Khalifa, he has the treasures, he has Baytul Mal, he has this, he's that. So Sayyid ibn Musayyib told him, 
Do you know the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that said that this dunya, this world is like the wing of a mosquito, but not even that. And that's a, it's a part of a longer hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about, uh, and how Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions about how in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the world is not the world of a mosquito or he wouldn't give the kafir a drink يعني, in the dunya and so on. It's about the luxuries of the dunya and so on. But he gave that and, he, and so then he, 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 put, he quoted a part of the hadith and then he said, what part of that wing of a mosquito are you trying to tempt me with? Yani, you're trying to tell me about these worldly things, but the whole world and all the church and everything is not even worth the wing of a mosquito in the eyes of Allah. So what insignificant part of that do you think I'm going to be tempted with? No. And this really upset Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. I mean, imagine he's the Khalifa and you know, this big news has gone on. Oh yeah, and then, then they're like, yeah, he got turned down. You know? But again, he didn't force it. But yani, some of the Kutub of Tarikh mentioned that because of that, he did at a time even have uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib whipped. I mean, he had lashes. Some of them mentioned a hundred, so on. Uh, but any which way, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib turned it down. Now, you could ask yourself, that such a woman who's known for that knowledge and piety and beauty and all of that, who did he marry her off to? And if you turn down the crown prince of the Khalifa, who later becomes the Khalifa as well, who did he? One time he's sitting in his dars and he looks around and he goes, where is one of the tulab ilm? And this talib ilm, I know some of them mention his name is Abdullah, but what is correct, looking at the different books and what has been narration, his name is Kathir uh, Ibn Abi Wada'a Al-Qurashi. So Kathir, and again, in most narrations, his name is not even mentioned. That's how يعني, unknown he was. But this is his يعني, actual name. So he was one of the students of Sayyid ibn Musayyib. So Sayyid ibn Musayyib looked around, he said, where is Kathir? So the people said, we don't know, we haven't seen him for a while. So then he called for him, when he came, he told him, what happened? So Kathir, he said, my, my in most of the books will mention Ibn Abi Wada'a. He said, my wife died. And because she died, with her burial and then taking care of the house and the kids without a wife, it, it, I, I, got, I got caught up in that, and that's why I haven't been coming. So Sayyid al Musayyib told him, marry another one. So he told him, who will give me a daughter? All I have in this dunya is dirhamain. Is two dirham, not dinar. This is very important. Many of our brothers, unfortunately, don't know what's the difference between a dinar and a dirham and how much is a dinar according to gold. And so a dinar is gold. Dirham is silver. So dirham is a lighter currency. And, and in the fifth durus under zakat, we talked about how many grams and all that. But two dirham is nothing compared to what people would have. So all he had in this world was two dirham. He said, all I have is two dirham. Who's going to marry their daughter to me for two dirham? And, and he was, again, he was older because he had already been married and his wife had died and he had children and all of the situation. And he was not like, and he wasn't famous for knowledge even. He wasn't like one of the great fuqaha, sab'a or anything like that either. As I mentioned, most of the books don't even mention his name. Sayyid ibn Musayyib saw this student to be mukhlis and he's sincere and Allah knows the hearts. We don't judge people's hearts. So he told them, I will bury my daughter to you. <laughs> this is recently after turning the Khalifa down. So now, Ibn Abi Wada'a, Kathir, he was in shock. He didn't really know like, how to handle this situation because he could not have imagined it. Right? So, of course, he's like, all I have is two dirham. Some of the books mention three, but more authentic is two. <laughs> Sayyid al Musayyib said, Okay, that's your man. Two dirham, that's it. <laughs> and he didn't say, Okay, wait, I gotta call my grandmother's uncle's roommates to come from this country and we're gonna have to throw it such a big. Uh, no, he just gathered some people, two witnesses, okay, I'm the wali, you come, come, sat down, did the nikah right there. Done. Simple. SubhanAllah. Today we have complicated this marriage so much that 
that all kind of fitting have come in our ummah because we've made it. No, no, he has to be a doctor and a doctor and an engineer and a alim and a hafiz and have a Benz and have three cars. And then your daughter is 40 years old, not married. You know, and you're like, what happened? Right? Why? The mehr should be light. I'm not saying any, you shouldn't have a mehr. Of course, it's from the sunnah. It shows it to be, but it should be light. Million dollars and 500,000 and uh, what's wrong with you people? This is why the ummah has got these fits in. Look at one of the great scholars and how he dealt with it. Khalas. Did the nikah? Done. Okay. Because here he goes back home now. Now he's still in a state of shock. Like he doesn't believe this has happened. And subhanAllah, and these are authentic narrations, he mentions he was fasting that day. And all he had was bread and oil. This was their food. Bread and oil. That's what he was going to break his fast with, right? So now he's sitting down. He's like, subhanAllah, how am I going to deal with this situation and so on? When he gets a knock. Who's there? Sa'id. Now he himself says, and this is the student of Sa'id ibn Musayyib. He says, every Sa'id that I know went through my mind except for my teacher. He said, everybody that I know named Sa'id went through my mind except for Sa'id ibn al Musayyib because he would never go to people's places. His schedule was home, masjid, earn your risk, masjid, home. Yani? So he thought it couldn't be him. It he said every so he, he goes with Sa'id. So he tells him Sa'id Ibn Musayyid. He's in shock. He opens the door, he finds his teacher there. And those I mean those Talab had that love and respect and, and he, he said he would shake when he would be in front of his teacher. This is why it's so funny nowadays when you go to like an Islamic you know class somewhere. And the students are all kicking it with their legs up and they're calling their teacher by their first name. And it, SubhanAllah. This is why the, the value of the knowledge left us. You know Imam Shafi'i, regressing a little bit just, and I've mentioned this many a time, but to understand. Imam Shafi'i said that I wouldn't even point my feet towards my teacher's house. Not even towards his house. Not that it's haram, not that it's an ayah hadith, adab. Abu Yusuf, Al Qadi Abu Yusuf said, For 40 years I never made a dua except that I remembered Abu Hanifa in it, his teacher. Imam Abu Hanifa, I mean, this was his, his teacher. Even though they were very close, I mean, it's not like it was a very, I mean, Imam Muhammad al Shaybani, Qadi Abu Yusuf, Imam Abu Hanifa, they were, they're called Ashabi. But even then they had that etiquette. So here, Ibn Abi Wada' he was in shock. He sees his teacher, and his teacher tells him, look, uh, we did the nikah, and I felt like you shouldn't spend the night alone, so I brought my daughter. <laughs> She's yours, that's it. No, yani, rukhsati or some other, you know, formalities. No, that's it. Yani, and... With her haya, her shyness, she was behind her, husband, her, her, her father, hiding. And he turned and he said, here's your wife, Abbas. Now imagine this is a woman that the Khalifa got turned down for. And this is the simplicity of it. And he left. Now at this point, some of the ulema of tarikh, they mentioned she, was, she had such shyness, and you know, she, she had never been married and so on, that she fainted. Being alone with somebody like that, even though it was her husband now, but she fainted. So he sat her down and calmed her down. He pushed the oil and bread to the side. He didn't want her to think this is all I have. And he went up to the roof and he started to call because the families would be somewhere close. And he started to call the people like, I have the daughter of Sayyid ibn Masih, what should I do? So his mother, she said, look, my face is haram on you, meaning our faces will not see, meaning that she gave him like a strong uh, I mean, a commitment, unless you give her to me for a few days. Most ulema said for three days then she went to be with the mother-in-law. Just so she can get used to being around the household and so on. And yani, serve the mother-in-law, the mother-in-law would give her advice and so on. And after three days then she came and lived with Kathir ibn Abi Wada'a. 
And this was something that the people couldn't believe. It was something unheard of at that time, that the Khalifa would get turned down like that. Now, Kathir, right after his wife came to him, he was going to go back to the dars. So his wife told him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go take the knowledge of your father. So she said, wait, let me teach you whatever he has taught me, so you can take that and then you can continue with him. So for a month, he took all the ahadith that she had learned from her father. She had sat and taken that knowledge from her father. And when he went back, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he asked him when he saw him coming after a month, and he told him, how are things? How is your companion? He said, I've never seen a woman more beautiful, more pious, more knowledgeable, more obedient of the husband's order and more most yani, sticking to the, to the rights of the husband than this woman. And Subhanallah, how Allah gives the rizq. The other very important yani, uh, narration about his life. And there is a lot. I mean, I had to choose very little from it. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Everybody knows Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And how cruel he was. The murderer. Most of the ulema have said that just the people he executed himself from his own command or his own hand or in front of him that he captured and executed or had executed upon his... Not, not about wars and things. Just the executions is 125,000. This man killed 125,000. In fact, looking into this in the Jamia of Imam al-Tirmidhi, Hisham ibn Hassan, he himself, and this is a hadith, and it's actually in the Jamia of Imam al-Tirmidhi, he says, we counted 120,000 that he killed. So you can see what a, yani, a feared person he was. He used to have a mat, and I discussed him in the durus earlier, so I'm not going to go in detail, but he used to have a mat and a place where he would sit in Medina, and if he wanted anybody killed, he would call them. And in his twisted mind, he would justify saying that all these people were there when Afmar Radian was killed, so all of them are guilty of murder, so they can all be killed. <laughs> Which is wrong, because many of those people defended Afmar Radian. The vast majority of the people in Medina had nothing to do with it. These people that killed Afmar Radian came from outside. They were not Sahaba and so on, right? But he had this, yani, and this is an, uh, uh, unfortunately even in our time, the people who get the Kharaji mindset, they get these kinds of ideas. You know, they say, oh, you live in a, this country, and this country is on Kufr, so you can be killed. Like, well, what do I? I just live there. Yani, so be, and you have to be careful. But Hajjaj had that mindset. He was very cool. He would shed blood like you wouldn't believe. He came to Medina one time, and he was not any ruling Medina at the time, but he was with the Khalafa. And people knew, even at that time, of the murders he had done, and people feared him. So he came, and he was praying next to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. Qadr would have it. He was praying next to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. And Hajjaj, he was praying, he was, he was going before the Imam. Like you know when the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, to go into Rukou, he was going quick. As many of brothers, I mean, alhamdulillah, not so much in this masjid, but when you go pray outside, you'll see a lot of people, yeah, they're, they're, I don't know why, I don't know what they're in a hurry to do. They're not going to finish before the Imam Taslim anyway. But. And even to sujood, he was going before the Imam and so on, and he was fidgety in his salah and trying to be fast, you know. So Sayyid ibn al-Musayyib, after he finished his salah, he grabbed his rada, the, the top cloth, you know, the... In the time of the Sahaba radiyan home, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and after that, they would have what we call the thobe today, would be called the qamis, which is this fitted, and he stitched thobe that we call, that was called the qamis. And that was the favorite cloth, clothing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as the hadith in Ibn Majah. But one of the common clothing of that time was the izar and rada, which was what you today wear when you go for umrah and hajj in the ahram. They weren't always white. Ahram doesn't have to be white. It's mustahab to be white, but it doesn't have to be. But the ahram is not like a special clothing that you only wear for Umrah and Hajj. This was something they used to regularly wear as well. 
So they would have the izar, the loin cloth, the mawis as the Somali brothers call it, or lungi as it's called in India, Pakistan, and so on, right? And they would have a top cloth that would just tie around like a big shawl, and that was their dress. So he grabbed his rida, the top cloth, he grabbed it after salah, after the taslim, and he grabbed it. But he didn't respond to him because he wanted to finish his dhikr. So he grabbed him, made him sit down, but he continued his dhikr, kept him quiet. And after he finished his adhkar, he told him, Ya Sariq, and you, oh thief, Ya Khain, oh the one who betrays the trust. What kind of salah is this? What are you doing? And those words being spoken to Hajjad was unimaginable. Hajjad would kill people for no reason at times. And this is. Yani, but to speak like that to Hajjad ibn Yusuf, no way. And I mentioned, this is mentioned by many ulama in their different books with the Sanib. It's not like you know, a, a side story. So when he spoke like that to Hajjad, people around Hajjaj thought Hajjaj was just going to. Because you know, they would, he would carry his sword and he had his men and he, had his, he would just kill him. But Hajjaj sat down. And he told Hajjaj, when you make ruku, be calm in your ruku, don't perceive the Imam. He mentioned the hadith, when you make sujood, he gave him the nasiha from hadith. And Hajjaj bin Yusuf did not respond. He just walked away. Now, as time passed, Hajjaj became the Amir of Hijaz, especially Medina. So now, Hajjaj comes back to Medina, but now he's the ruler of Medina. And he is murdering people. Because at that time there were rebellions and things. So he is murdering people right, left, and center. And he comes to the masjid, and who does he see? Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. And he goes to him, and he sits with him. And Sa'id al Musayyib is sitting, and he tells them, you remember when you said these words to me? Hajjaj tells him. When you called me a Sarat and a Khain and you told me this and you told me this and you told me this. And Sa'id ibn Musayyib says, Now, I remember that. You know, at this time, what are you going to do? You're going to chicken out? You're going to, you're going to, kill, you're going to kill you anyway, right? He's like, Now, I remember that. He tells him, Jazakum Allahu khair. May Allah bless you. He goes, I have not prayed a single salah from that time till today, except that your words reminded me and I improved my salah. Hajjaj killed a lot of people. Sahaba, Tabi'un, pious people. But what people forget his qadr is there. If your qadr is written that you're going to be killed by that person, you're going to be killed by that person. But Allah is qadr on everything. Meaning that Hajjaj is not, you shouldn't fear somebody more than you fear Allah. If Allah wrote your qadr, khalas, it will happen anyway. But know this that nobody, no Zionists, no lobby, no no government, no nations, and no nobody is more powerful than Allah. No Mason, no Illuminati, no 33 degrees and 12s and backflips and eagle eyes and whatever else and pyramid. All of those bakr is there, I know. But Allah is qadr on all of them. Remember that. Anas ibn Malik was also invited by Hajjaj. It's a separate issue. And he brought him to that mat where he would kill people. And he had this mat to soak in the blood, so the blood doesn't flow. And when you were invited on that mat, it means you were killed. And he brought Anas ibn Malik, and Anas ibn Malik, he made dua to Allah, he went. And when he got there on that same mat, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf made a kram of him. Brought food for him. Honored him. When he walked away, people told him, how? Anas ibn Malik said, I made dua. I asked Allah. So, this was uh, something very interesting from his life. The last thing I will mention, and will end inshallah, is he was one of the people that Allah blessed with the ability to give meaning to dreams. Ta'bir al ruqya He would explain. Ibn Sirin, obviously the more famous one from that generation as well. But 
No doubt, as Imam Ahmad and the Shafi'i and others have mentioned about him, and Ibn Kathir and al Dhahabi and others have documented, and Ibn Sa'ad and his tabaqat, and Ibn Jawzi, and, uh, and so on. Many uh, Imma and Ulema have talked about the fact that he was very proficient in explaining dreams. And this is not, of course, there are ayats that people use regarding the story of Yusuf in the Quran and so on, and there are ahadith that explain it. But a lot of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not an exact science. It's not like fiqh where we give the exact, you know, you could see a dream and, and you could see a dream, the exact same dream and have two different meanings. And that's why people shouldn't self-diagnose dreams and so on as well. So here, a man came to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib and he said that I saw in my dream, my teeth fell out into my hands and I buried them. And Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib said that your family members will be dying before you, and even those that are younger, and you will bury them. And as they mentioned, this is what happened. Now interestingly, other people came to him with dreams about teeth falling, and he gave them different meanings. Because the meaning has to do with the person as well. Because many dreams may look good, but they are from shaitan. Like Abdul Qadir Jalani and others have talked about dreams that they had that seemed like they were pious dreams, but they were tricks of shaitan. And many dreams may seem evil, but in reality they have a good meaning to them. One man saw, and this is one of the very interesting meanings, that Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was urinating in Masjid al Nabawi facing the Qibla. Now, if somebody brought that to me, I would say this is a very evil thing that he's doing, you know. But he went to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib and he said, I saw a dream where Abdul Malik ibn Marwan is urinating in Masjid al Nabawi facing the Qibla. When he said this, he told him how many times did he urinate? He said in the dream four times. He said then four of his lineage will become Khulafa after him. And I said, I, uh, how do you get that meaning? And that is what happened. A man saw that he was in the shade and then under the sunlight. So he told Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib that I saw this dream where I'm under the shade and then I'm under the bright sun. Now, many people may see that to be a good thing, right? Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib said, you will become murtad. <laughs> You will become an apostate. So the man, when he heard this, like he got, and then people were sitting, you know, that's why be careful, you know, with dreams and me. He told him, no, no, in the dream, I was pushed out. It's not that I went out into the sunlight on my, he was trying to change it up, you know. He told him, you know what? You will still become an apostate, but you will not like it. And they said that man, he was in a far land, and the land was captured by kuffar and so on, and he did become an apostate, but he, he was under and he was trying to fit in and so on. And later he came back to Islam. And he came back and he mentioned this dream. I mean, the interpretation had been done earlier, but he mentioned what happened to him. And he mentioned that uh, Sayyid al Musayyib had made that interpretation a long time ago. This is the last one Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu anhuma, the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He saw a dream that between his eyes it was written, Qul Huwallahu Ahad. And when he saw this dream and he told his close family, they became very happy. Because this is something good. They saw it as something good. Surah Ikhlas, I mean, one of Greatest, one of the greatest surah of the Qur'an, one surah of the Qur'an, so many fadail, and so on. In the beginning of it, such a beautiful meaning between his eyes in a dream. When they took this dream to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib and told him, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib said, in a few days, he will pass away. Now he was young and healthy and people were like, what is he talking about? And subhanAllah, a few days after that he was poisoned. And he became one of the shuhada, as we see it to be, and he passed away. Sayyid al-Musayyib, 
lived yani, as I said into his late 70s most of the ulema said around 75 years of age some have given an older age he went through many different stages yani, through the time of the khalafah of Umar when he was born and Uthman and uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah anhum, and then Hassan anhu, and so on and then through the Amawiyya, as we mentioned, Abdul Manik bin Marwan, and later yani, through the Amawis and so on. And he was a very balanced person. He continued to teach. He focused on teaching. He stayed away from the fitna between the Muslims. And he spoke the truth. But he also didn't call for revolts and didn't try to and he go out and, and, and cause issues against even when he disagreed with a lot of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan's policies he would clarify the haq but he would not call them out by name and this is something very interesting because from the generation of Tabi'un you find different attitudes towards these things but he was very balanced and he dedicated his life to hadith even though, as I mentioned, he was a scholar in tafsir as well, and he was a faqih and so on, but the greatest uloom that he is famous for is hadith. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these salaf al salihin these great predecessors that were upon piety, are not just heard about for passing time, but to be taken as examples, knowing we cannot reach their level. Knowing we cannot reach their level. But it should inspire us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those that benefit from what we hear and practice upon it.